If everybody could take their seats, please. All right, we'll get started. This will not be a long introduction. Our first speaker, quiet, please, quiet, please. Our first speaker is Daniel Harari from the Weizmann. He's going to talk to us about the digital baby guiding learning by innate structures. Listen and learn, Alfonso. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. So if you stop hearing me at some point, just wave and I will use the other microphone. Um, so uh, I thank uh, the organizing committee to, for inviting me. Um, uh, I'm really excited uh, to, uh, to talk about uh, my research. And I think uh, most of you are from backgrounds that relate to cognitive science and neuroscience, um, while my major uh, discipline is computer science and artificial intelligence. Uh, so I tried as much a, as I can to um, uh, bring you the higher level uh, intuition about my work, and I managed to uh, uh, build a presentation which doesn't have even a single uh, formula, so I hope you can uh, survive this. Um, so um, I want to talk about, as an AI person, uh, about a system that starts from visual sensation and ends with visual, visual perception. Um, it doesn't have any um, world knowledge. Um, it can observe the world around it and gather some experience. And through um, that experience, uh, develop representations of various concepts. So uh, if you think about it for a little bit, um, it sounds like this is um, very much the, um, goes along the empiricism uh, approach, uh, but if we consider um, the slightly different interpretation that Alfonso uh, suggested yesterday, uh, if we combine this intelligence system um, uh, structures within the system that allow the learning of concepts uh, through experience, then actually this is a, uh, might be a nice compromise between uh, the nativism approach and the um, uh, empiricism approach. Uh, because you can then learn almost anything from the environment uh, using this uh, structure. So um, let's go uh, through some examples uh, from humans uh, about early acquired visual concepts. Um, so uh, it was shown that between the ages of uh, two to three months of age, uh, infants are able to distinguish between uh, occlusion when one object occludes the other and containment where one object is inserted into another object. Um, around the same age, uh, infants uh, start to follow gaze direction of other people. And uh, not much later, um, they can actually recognize uh, hands are as agents of change. So uh, I'll uh, explain later how we use these um, empirical uh, uh, knowledge about, uh, about uh, the development uh, to suggest some models for the computational learning behind uh, this uh, acquisition. Um, as an AI person, I have to uh, present the current approach uh, for machine learning um, with uh, a, a kind of an addition to vision, which is my uh, favorite uh, domain. So uh, you probably all heard about the deep neural networks uh, that once are given a very large sets of annotated examples are able to learn a lot of uh, tasks. Uh, here you see uh, some uh, high-level visual tasks like um, uh, image categorization, uh, segmentation, uh, depth, and detection. And um, 
there are more, more and more uh, tasks that uh, uh, these networks are able to, uh, to solve. And some of them are even already kind of superhuman um, uh, by means of, of performance. Um, however, what happens if you don't have that much of labeled examples, uh, which is uh, probably what babies have. Um, so they only have their, um, their own ability to observe the world. Uh, they have poor communication by means of uh, language and interpretation of the uh, surrounding uh, adult environment but still they are able to learn and acquire a lot of visual uh, concepts and some of them are pretty complex uh, in the first year of life. Um, so I will go through several examples uh, in order to uh, demonstrate uh, how can this be learned ac uh, according to our belief. And um, so the first uh, example will be um, the acqu acquisition of depth uh, layout, or in particular, the figure ground uh, segregation. So how can a system uh, that does not uh, accept uh, external guidance uh, of images having uh, some pixels labeled as background and other pixels labeled as foreground can learn to distinguish between uh, the figure object and the background object. Uh, it doesn't know, any, does know anything about the semantics of the objects uh, or the background. So how is it possible? So we know that adults have um, a great capability to segregate objects in, even in a very crowded uh, scene like this. Uh, children. Uh, also have this ability, but it's a developing ability. And actually, when they are born, uh, they are not that good at it. So uh, how does it emerge? Um, so we believe that it all begins with motion. So we are born with a, a good ability uh, to analyze uh, the optical flow um, that is uh, um, extracted from uh, temporal dynamics of, of the uh, visual uh, sensation. And as you can see, uh, this can be uh, used to uh, use some seg segmentation. And it was shown that uh, young infants uh, are uh, specifically sensitive to uh, common motion. So if things, even if they look uh, different, move together, they are usually grouped as a, a single uh, entity, a single object. And another uh, sensitivity is to motion discontinuity. So we're able to detect boundaries of motion discontinuities. Uh, this ability was shown to, um, uh, to appear in infants as young as uh, one and two months of age. Um, so we suggest a model that starts uh, from analyzing uh, videos, in, like uh, uh, frames in motion, and ends up with the ability to segregate uh, figure in, in static images. Uh, the model goes through uh, two paths of processing. Uh, one is using motion discontinuities and creating some local occlusion boundaries um, representations. And the other one, uh, look at common motion and the, the, the grouping ability uh, to create some form of objects or um, let's say more um, contiguous regions in the images, okay? Um, so the, the local boundaries are more general. They uh, can uh, generalize uh, through um, novel object and novel backgrounds, while the uh, global appearance the, um, on, the, on the right uh, is more object specific or region specific. And what I mean is that uh, we don't need to actually recognize the type of object, but in a very short sequence of video, we can uh, recognize uh, the same instance of, of the uh, object that was shown. 
So uh, the model is presented with these kind of videos. No labels, just seeing these kind of videos. And we try to challenge the system with backgrounds that are pretty similar to the objects uh, by means of appearance. And uh, we use the capacity of uh, motion analysis. So this is the result of uh, motion segmentation uh, based only on the motion. And you see it's not perfect, but we already get uh, some regions that are uh, in the uh, figure in the foreground, uh, some regions that are in the background, but also some regions that are unknown to the, to the model. It doesn't have to be perfect, and infants don't have perfect abilities. Um, once we have this motion segmentation in a single frame, we, and we have this uh, for many frames, uh, for a, a single frame, we can extract local patches around the boundaries of the motion, okay? And we usually try to select uh, regions that have less unknowns um, just to, to have uh, better uh, examples. Uh, and for each of these patches along the boundary, we associate a direction for the figure direction. Okay, um, so this is only um, based on the motion. Um, also, on the other uh, processing level, uh, we extract a snapshot of the pixels that are in the foreground, okay? So we have these two patches and uh, some regions. From the patches, um, we uh, create a, a dictionary of informative patches, okay? And these, uh, these patches, as I said, um, are associated with the direction of the foreground uh, along the uh, boundary, uh, in the, usually in the middle of the, of the patch. Interestingly, um, these patches include some uh, very typical uh, boundary features that were found useful for humans um, in separating uh, objects from the background. Uh, this is a work, a behavioral work uh, by uh, Gose and Palmer, and they identified mainly uh, three types of, uh, of uh, occlusion cues. These are T-junctions, uh, convexity, and extremal edges. And I think that most of you can recognize in each of these small patches uh, which is the part of the foreground and the, the background. So interestingly, uh, our model uh, was able to extract uh, automatically this kind of features um, just from these uh, motion uh, boundaries. And for a, a given test patch, uh, then uh, classify uh, where is the figure side and the background side. Um, let me t t tell you that uh, in our implementation, we actually normalized the orientation of the patch uh, using the uh, maximal uh, directional gradient along the middle of the, uh, of the patch, but this is, uh, was just because we used a small number of uh, extracted patches, 100,000 of them, and if we use much more, which are uh, available since these are all internally labeled by the system, uh, we can uh, actually uh, dismiss this uh, constraint. So we get pretty good results, and when we apply this to every pixel location in the image and aggregate the, the figure ground uh, results for each, uh, for each pixel, we get for an entire image something like that. So it's a map. Um, the red uh, pixel indicate uh, a high confidence level for a uh, foreground side, and uh, the blue is the of uh, the background side. Um, but as you can see, we get nice uh, indications of the um, foreground and background sides, even on some regions that are on the object itself, but we also get some noise in the background. 
So this is not enough for the segregation. So that's why um, we look at another capacity that uh, um, infants have. Uh, this is the, the ability, uh, once we have uh, the, the prior knowledge of some familiarity of a region, to, uh, it will pop out. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So um, we, g we collect a, a lot of examples from the uh, video, and this can be maybe like a two second video. It's not very long, but it's enough to extract um, some, uh, some examples of, of the foreground region from the motion segmentation. And we use this example to uh, train uh, an object detector for this region, okay? So once we are presented with a, a new instance of, uh, of, the, of this region, even if it's on a different background, we are able to roughly detect the object in the image. Um, if we now combine both the local boundary information with the global form, we can get much better maps uh, that are both able to uh, locate the, the interesting region of the object in the scene and also have very fine definition of the boundaries of the object. And if we use this uh, to uh, segment out the object, we get results like this on the left side. And if we use just the same segmentation uh, um, algorithm without these cues, this is what we get. So this is, on the right, it's only based on appearance, and this is based on the segregation cues that we got. So this demonstrates um, the ability uh, to learn this uh, uh, segregation capability uh, without having any labels uh, from an external source. Uh, let me now Move on to um, another task, uh, which is related, and this is the ability to uh, discover a containment event and discriminate between objects that are simple in the sense that uh, they cannot contain other objects or containers. Um, so computationally, this is a very challenging task because um, containers uh, can be of various appearances, the, the variability is, uh, is very high. And also there are some subtleties. Uh, for example, in these examples, uh, you can see that the appearance uh, is quite similar, but since there is no opening here, uh, this is no longer a, a container that is available for uh, uh, performing an, uh, a containment event. As adults, we may still call this a container. Uh, we, we may classify it as a container, but at this point, it cannot contain other objects. It has to be transformed. Um, this is an example from uh, uh, empirical uh, tests on two and a half months of age uh, infants, uh, where they, uh, the, the, the sequence of, of test events is, uh, uh, has this uh, sequence of, of images. Uh, what, what you see here is that the container is first presented uh, to the infant, and then uh, two events may occur. The first one is that another object is being behind it. The object uh, is inserted inside, okay? And the two, two things may happen. One, when the uh, container moves to the side, uh, the object either uh, is, uh, the object always is there, but this is for an occlusion uh, and this is for containment. And it was shown that uh, infants were highly surprised when this event happened, so they, um, expected the object to be transferred uh, with, uh, with the container when it moves to the side. 
Um, so we kind of uh, looked at the empirical uh, um, evidence and built some kind of a timeline for the developmental path related to containment. So as, uh, as I showed, uh, at two and a half months of age, they are able, infants are able to discriminate between dynamic events of occlusion and containment. And later on, around four to five months of age, they are able to do it in, with uh, they are able to detect the from high angle, and I will show uh, what what's and only later, um, almost around one year uh, of age, they are able to um, uh, detect a support event. Okay. Uh, interestingly, depth cues come only, uh, start to emerge only at this age from binocular. So this is probably not the uh, most important thing for, for this uh, uh, computation. So we suggest a, a model that actually follow uh, this trajectory uh, of learning. Uh, we first have dynamic containment, uh, then the model is able to uh, discover containment events in static images. Uh, it, it is also able to measure the uh, looseness or tightness of the fit. And uh, finally, it, it is able to uh, recognize uh, containment from high view when the, the simple object that is being include, uh, inserted into the container is actually not being occluded by any parts of, of the container. Uh, we have some predictions for the cover and support uh, um, cases. I will talk about it. So um, to, get, to give you the intuition of the uh, computations behind it, uh, let's look at some examples. So in a simple occlusion, the simple object is either occluding the container or is being occluded by the container. But when a containment event happens, the uh, simple object first occludes the container, but then is being occluded by the, by the container while still occluding part of the container. Okay. So this is a paradoxical occlusion. And we uh, came up with uh, this kind of a learning scheme that um, uh, actually imitates the, the process that uh, uh, infants go through. So there is a familiar, familiarization phase uh, when the system can observe uh, moving objects that are going to participate in the, in the test. So you can uh, think of it as a, an introduction of the objects to the system, but there are no external labels whatsoever. And then uh, the testing phase, um, present uh, objects with some relation to, to uh, uh, other, another object. Uh, so the model uh, assumes these capacities uh, at the beginning of the process. And these capacities are known to be found also with infants uh, almost from birth. Uh, so as I said before, the computation of motion flow uh, the ability to group uh, regions and segregate them uh, from the background, and also the ability to analyze boundaries, and especially around motion dis discontinuities. So these are the test events that the, the model uh, sees uh, in the dynamic stage. And it, it has to uh, discriminate between in front, behind, and inside. Um, so the first capacity actually analyzes the optical flow, as can be seen in the middle frame, and extract some uh, figure ground segmentation as in the right, um, in the right uh, frame. Uh, the second capacity uh, is able to discriminate in a static frame uh, between the two regions, okay? Uh, but this is, uh, you can see here that uh, this is what actually the model uh, knows. So uh, the objects are a bunch of pixels, 
okay, that can be extract, discriminated uh, from the background or from each other, but no more. Uh, the other thing, which is uh, a, a most crucial uh, capacity, is the ability to detect the ownership uh, of uh, common borders along the motion discontinuities. So this scene is the other way around. Uh, the, this is the motion boundaries from the simple object that is being inserted. Uh, these are the detection of the two regions. And here you can see the, the boundary uh, start interacting with the other object. So in this case, this is a simple occlusion. Uh, the boundary always belongs to the blue object. Um, so what happens in a dynamic containment is that um, compared to, uh, to the case of a simple occlusion where the boundary belongs throughout the whole event to a single object, uh, in a containment event, there is a switch. At some point, the boundary uh, starts to belong to the container rather than the simple object that's being inserted. So a, a, a mechanism that is able to detect the switch, okay, this is a, a, the cue for learning, the paradoxical occlusion event. Uh, this is, can trigger the, uh, the attention for this, uh, for this event and discriminate it from the other occlusion um, uh, options. Um, once we have this stage, uh, we are able to discriminate uh, the events uh, in dynamic uh, stages, uh, in dynamic uh, scenes. Um, the, the model goes through uh, some kind of um, uh, maturement and has increased capacities. Uh, in, in, this, uh, in this stage, um, we are able to extract internal boundaries along the motion discontinuities. Uh, as you can see here, this is the optical flow, and this is the ability to have some um, detection of the internal boundary uh, of the container. And this happens only with containers, not with the single objects. Uh, once we have this uh, capacity, uh, we're able in static images uh, to discriminate between uh, occlu simple occlusion and uh, uh, containment, uh, also by detecting a paradoxical occlusion where we have a combination of ownership along the common borders. Um, at this stage, we are also able to uh, measure the fitness uh, of, of the object uh, only by uh, analyzing uh, uh, the boundaries along the internal uh, discontinuity on the rim of the, of the container. And this is known also in infants to uh, occur around the stage where, where static, uh, uh, static containment is, is uh, discovered. Um, a, a, a new capacity that we need in order to, uh, to go to the next stage is uh, the actual ability to uh, discriminate uh, within a container between the front region and the back, re back region that are being separated by the internal boundary. Okay? So when we uh, include this capacity in the model, we're able to move to the next stage uh, when we recognize a containment event even uh, with a high angle view uh, although the, the container no longer occludes the, um, the simple object, so there is no paradoxical occlusion at this stage. Uh, however, uh, if, we th if you think a little bit about it, um, in real life, uh, the, the two views, the low view and high view, uh, may be really uh, uh, temporally related. So a little change in the viewer uh, angle uh, may switch between the two stages, so the system will be able to, um, to move from one representation to the second representation 
uh, pretty easily without external uh, influence. Um, one, one prediction of the model is that at an early stage, uh, the high view containment may be confused with in front relation until the ability to separate between the front and back regions are uh, uh, inserted into, into the, in the, the model capabilities. Uh, so we get pretty good performance results on, on, uh, on our test events. Um, and uh, I want to uh, say a few words about the predictions about cover and support, because these are interesting cases. Um, uh, intuitively, it seems that cover is the same as containment. But if you look closely, uh, in these cases, uh, you actually don't see the rim of the, of the container. And, um, and we, uh, we predict that if infants uh, are shown these kind of events without presenting them first the internal side of the, of the, of the container, uh, they will think that this is a simple occlusion. Um, th there are some uh, empirical uh, tests that uh, uh, were done with, uh, with cover events, uh, but in all these uh, tests, uh, infants were shown that the container has an opening, and only then uh, they were presented with the event. Uh, another um, prediction is about support, which looks kind of a simple thing, but actually if you analyze um, the, uh, uh, the motion formation and the motion discontinuity uh, uh, information, you can see that uh, in, in a, as we simulated here with uh, artificial uh, boxes, uh, there are no motion discontinuities along the edges of the, of the closed box. So this is a much more difficult uh, computationally to detect that the uh, one object is being on top of, of the other object, object rather, rather than just being adjacent to. Um, and indeed, this uh, um, disability uh, is, uh, uh, was uh, detected in, uh, was shown to uh, appear in infants only late uh, at the age. Um, okay, so the last thing that I wanted to, um, to show you uh, relates to the ability to recognize hands, uh, and I mean hands, the, the palm of the hand. And a related uh, ability is uh, uh, to uh, predict the direction of gaze of others. Uh, there are two related, and uh, I'll show you how. So. Again, from uh, empirical uh, evidence, we know that infants are sensitive uh, to hands as agents of change. And what this means is that uh, when uh, there is an agent that perform, uh, that is uh, uh, approaching some, uh, some object and uh, do so, uh, does some manipulation on the object, uh, infants are sensitive to the, uh, the agent, the identity of the agent uh, that is related to the change, rather to the appearance of the uh, that is being manipulated. Um, so uh, we defined, uh, a, again, some kind of a guiding signal uh, called the mover. And the mover, computationally, is defined as a moving region that changes the static ground. This is a demonstration of a mover event. There is some optical flow going into a region, and after the flow is being out of the region, there is a change in the appearance of, of this particular re uh, region. Uh, we don't need any ability to recognize uh, the, the actual object that is going into uh, this, the region or to know anything semantic about the appearance of, of the region. We just need to memorize uh, for a very short period the appearance um, as it was 
uh, before the motion entered the region. So here you see that we kind of uh, split the, the image into uh, some rectangular regions. We analyze the optical flow, and for a particular region, once if the flow c comes in, we memorize the appearance as it was before, and we compare the, the appearance once the uh, optical flow is out of that region. If there is a change, we uh, detect a mover event. Okay? So the motion was actually uh, uh, doing something active on that region. Uh, so with infants, um, it happens to, to be a very strong cue for detecting hands in their, their environment. If you think about it, uh, most of the active agents in, in an infant environment uh, may be related to, uh, to, uh, to hands. And here we uh, uh, recorded some videos of a hand uh, interacting with objects uh, when there is also general motion in the, in the scene. So the detector is able to detect only uh, uh, the mover events uh, and not uh, detect uh, just add any other motion uh, in the scene. And as you can see in a short while, even when the ball uh, the, is captured as a mover, uh, it fires too. So if we use these events, you know, uh, some patches around uh, the center of the temporal events, sorry, uh, we can uh, use a, a classifier to, uh, uh, to train for, for uh, uh, to discover the, the, the main um, appearance uh, that appears in, the, in these examples. Uh, we can uh, use some more examples just by using tracking uh, uh, from the center of event, so we can get some more examples. And uh, we then test these, uh, this classifier on two types of, uh, of videos, uh, one which is uh, uh, more similar to the uh, mover uh, extraction uh, uh, pose, when people manipulate objects, but the other one is just moving the, the hands freely in space and changing the pose. Um, when we test on these uh, on these uh, videos, uh, we uh, results in red. Um, so what we see here is the precision, the hit rate, versus the the recall. Um, the mover detector. Um, performs really good for manipulating uh, scenes, but what you can see here is interesting. It seems at first that there, this is a very poor performance, but for a very uh, a small recall of uh, events, the accuracy is very, very high. So this means that uh, a model that relays on uh, the, the best uh, detections that he has with the best confidence, uh, it's really reliable. It can, it can, uh, um, it can use this example to, uh, to train a, a good classifier, at least for these, uh, for these examples. Uh, the other colors just show you what happens when we use, uh, instead of uh, mover events, uh, other uh, sources like informative fragments or just general motion um, uh, patches. Um, so uh, in order to generalize to other uh, poses of the hand, uh, we use another uh, capability that is available to infants, and that is uh, uh, the ability to relate uh, to a, a reference face which is around the, the, the manipulating uh, hand. So uh, if we have, for example, um, this, uh, this appearance uh, already familiar to the, to the model, we, uh, we extract and we want to, uh, to learn a new appearance. We first extract uh, some kind of uh, trace Along, uh, along the body, 
uh, along that the, the body context from a reference face nearby. And then in a test image, we, uh, we use uh, the same path from the face to detect the hand region. And then we can extract the new appearance, OK? Uh, just follow, so the, the, the model at this stage uh, is familiar with this trajectory of features from the, from the, uh, from the face to what it assumes to be a hand. This is what happens here. And then when it detects the, the last point in, the, in this trajectory, it extracts a new example of what he now believes to be a, a new hand. So from a, a known appearance, we get new appearances uh, using the, the body context through the face. Uh, if we do this code training when we use uh, appear local appearance, and context uh, information, uh, which, is, uh, which is also known to be uh, available for, for infants, we can actually, uh, after very few such iterations, uh, get this uh, green uh, graph in the, in the performance graph here, uh, which is quite high, uh, especially if we consider the red here as the best uh, that the model can provide using supervised examples. And this is surprising, just after three phases of this code training. So again, um, this is an example of, of training without external guidance, just using the, uh, the cue uh, of the mover as a guiding signal for, uh, for the system to learn. Uh, a related uh, uh, topic is uh, trying to learn a gaze estimation, and I will show you uh, shortly why this is related. Uh, when we want to uh, analyze uh, other people's gaze direction, we want to associate uh, a direction. Yeah. Okay. We want to associate a direction with uh, uh, with the face uh, that is being shown. Uh, and infants, as I said, are able to do it uh, pretty early. So if we consider uh, the nature of, the, um, of humans when we uh, move, when move objects, we actually attend to the object just slightly before um, the actual move. Um, and if we use this cue, we can associate uh, with mover events the direction of a face that is nearby uh, and the, the location of the event. If we use these um, examples as training for a classifier, we get very good results. Here are some examples when we compare uh, this kind of classifier in red uh, with, human, uh, with human predictions in green when they are shown these kind of images of, of faces. And this is the a performance graph, uh, which shows um, that the, uh, the model, which is in red, uh, get pretty good results compared to uh, the supervised and the human uh, uh, su subjects. Um, so here is a demo of the abilities that were acquired. Uh, without any external guidance. So you can see in red the mover events, then the detected hands, and the gaze direction. Now, it may, it may be that in, at this stage, the gaze direction is mainly uh, using the, the head orientation rather than eye gaze, uh, but this is also uh, known to be uh, the case with, with infants. And um, actually, we uh, ex extended the model uh, uh, later uh, to have uh, a really uh, fine um, ability to use the, also the eyes. And we, uh, we use uh, depth information to extract now uh, 3D gaze rather than 2D gaze from 2D images. Um, this is uh, very useful when we want to uh, analyze 
uh, scenes by means of social intelligence. And in this example, we want to discover joint attention. So, so we combine the ability to extract 3D gaze uh, from 2D images with some estimation of the uh, depth in the, in the scene and uh, some segmentation of regions, coherent regions in the scene. And when we combine these three sources of information, we are able to um, discover in all these uh, scenes uh, uh, cases of joint attention where there's a common target versus uh, events where uh, there are different targets. So this is very useful for understanding social uh, scenes. Um, so we can think of the learning trajectory uh, in this sense that we um, can actually learn a lot of uh, complex visual concepts uh, just by uh, going with these uh, abilities of using uh, internal uh, cues uh, to get more and more uh, concepts uh, from experience. And um, I'll summarize first that uh, we saw how models um, use these internal cues uh, to learn the concepts automatically. Um, the, the models uh, um, can also provide uh, reasons uh, for the human development trajectory, trajectory which is sometimes uh, very peculiar and not very intuitive. And um, we, um, uh, I think that interestingly, uh, as I showed before, the current learning me methods um, cannot explain these uh, ab learning abilities, uh, both in infants and also without uh, supervision. So uh, I will uh, remark that uh, this mechanism of internal supervision um, can serve uh, actually a few useful and general roles for uh, intelligent systems. Uh, so first, we don't need to use so many examples which are sometimes very unnatural. Um, uh, but then we can also uh, allow the, the system to acquire concepts that uh, may be very su subtle in the, in the environment, but they are very uh, meaningful and crucial for the observer itself. And this can be done uh, by having these uh, internal structures uh, um, created in the, in the system uh, through evolution, for example. And um, these uh, this built uh, structures um, can, also um, can also provide us with the capacities uh, that can uh, uh, guide the, the learning process uh, rather than use explicit representations. What I mean by that is that the structure they do not have to actually encode the final concepts, but they actually uh, frame the learning process in order to uh, allow uh, the system get to the, the specific concepts by experiencing and observing uh, the world. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, questions? Thank you. Very interesting and very impressive. Uh, I like this is what's required to be a containment event and so forth. I guess I had a, a general question. Uh, the performance of your algorithms was very impressive in a lot of circumstances, but of course wasn't completely equal to humans or 100% correct, uh, which be unsurprising, but what do you do with those um, differences between human and algorithm performance? Is It could be that there's some uninteresting reason for it. You didn't have quite enough training examples or you know, something about the network wasn't quite right. Or on the other hand, it's conceivable, I guess, that there's some in principle limitation of the algorithm 
such that it's going to fall short of human performance or it's going to fail in particular ways that humans don't fail. And that would have very different implications, I guess. So, right, so can you say anything about, about that? Yeah, so um, the main goal was actually to demonstrate the ability to learn about uh, this, this kind of concept. We didn't aim for a very good performance uh, by means of the, of the uh, results, but it turned out that they came pretty good. Uh, still, when we compare this to, uh, to humans, uh, humans have better uh, abilities, and we, we don't say that um, the implementation of our model actually uses uh, the exact same computation, uh, computations that uh, humans uh, that humans have, but we rather uh, look at this uh, as if we uh, use uh, some uh, much primitive and simpler uh, computations, uh, we still are able to uh, extract the information that is needed to uh, learn about these concepts. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't seem uh, uh, conceivable even to uh, try to extract the information that is needed to to, to learn anything about this uh, this concept. But uh, as, as you say, the, there's still a gap between the model uh, performance and the, and the human's performance. And I think uh, if uh, we try to uh, uh, maybe uh, look at specific uh, uh, computational processes uh, in the brain, and maybe use um, uh, neural nets that uh, come uh, closer to uh, human abilities as, as I showed before, uh, we can try and improve the, the performance of, of the existing uh, models. Well, let me pursue it just a little bit yeah. further. Have you looked at the failures? Is there anything systematic about them such that there's certain, there's certain specific systematic things that the algorithm fails to do? Uh, and would that give you any clues as to how it could be improved or how it could, if you're trying to model human performance, how it could more accurately model? Yeah, sure. We, we, we are definitely uh, looking into the, the failures and the errors too. Um, let me give you an example uh, from uh, the, the gaze uh, detection algorithm. So um, um, what, we, what we noticed is that uh, most of the information that this model captures uh, is taken from the head orientation rather than the, the eyes. And if you um, actually present uh, images uh, where, where the, the eyes are looking in a very different way than the head orientation, this model cannot uh, cope with this. And uh, when we investigated it a little bit further, um, we saw that actually uh, the, the processing in the brain um, uh, has uh, these two mechanisms uh, that extract information from the head orientation and then corrects the gaze uh, using the eyes, the, the offset between the eyes and the, and the head orientation. And uh, at, the, at the, the next stage of, of our model, uh, when I showed you the 3D, uh, uh, gaze estimation, which is much more accurate, we actually uh, use uh, a two-stage processing, which first uh, extract the head orientation, and then only then uh, uh, copes with the offset from the from the eye gaze, and uh, and use a, a different representation of the appearance of the eyes rather than just the global uh, face. Uh, so this is an example, but we, we also analyzed other uh, things related to the containment, uh, and uh, we're working on it. Um, I have a question because one of your introductory slides, you showed the deep neural networks, and you showed, okay, there's those labeled images, but we don't, as humans, actually have everything labeled, right? Right. Um, and this is the point where I'm not sure if that's true, because maybe the difference between your model and real infants is that you as parents keep talking and labeling everything. Right. So but while there is this, those motion cues and everything, even as they're small toddlers and small babies, you start saying, oh, here's a choo-choo train, -choo, choo -choo here's that. Um, so how would the model be um, 
improved, do you think, if you would include some labels which are obviously there that are you know, provided by the parents? So, so that, that's true. And uh, as you go along, uh, as the, the infant is growing, it gets more and more uh, input from the, and guidance from the, from the environment. Uh, as you saw, for example, from the mover uh, uh, detector, uh, it first had a lot of noise captured within the, the initial examples. Uh, so once you uh, uh, allow some external guidance to cope in and you can eliminate uh, some of the, of the noise, uh, of course the, the algorithm will learn much better model uh, for the appearance and will make much less uh, mistakes. And in the pipeline, in the co-training uh, uh, process, uh, it will, of course, boost from these uh, more pure um, example sets. Um, we, we focused actually on the, the very early stages uh, where uh, the infants can get much even from the guidance of the, of the parents because they, they don't understand the language and they don't understand the meaning of pointing and presenting. But of course, uh, later on, it, it can improve. Yeah. A question at the back. That's my seat anyway. <laughs> Hi, very nice talk. Um, the, other, the other thing, sort of similar to this, is the difference between, you know, robots and babies is that babies self-construct information. Visual knowledge, conceptual knowledge happens when they start to interact with objects. And I was kind of wondering if you would, you know, implement that in your models. Yeah, so uh, uh, that, that's true that uh, um, this model did not include uh, the interaction, the active interaction of, of uh, infants with the environment. Uh, but this is actually uh, a bit later in development, right? Because uh, at the beginning, like uh, until the age of six months, uh, uh, the infants are not uh, um, willingly um, manipulating the, the, the environment. I mean, they have pretty limited uh, motor skills and, and control. Uh, it, it's more like they, uh, they happen to, to do stuff. They can hit things and they, learn, they can learn a, a bit about the environment. Uh, uh, so this is, of course, a, a good source of information, but still it is uh, internal. It's not uh, having an external labeling. Uh, they can interpret this information uh, as they go along. So um, this is, might be related to uh, a different uh, uh, type of learning, uh, reinforcement learning, uh, which uh, you get feedback from the environment, uh, but you can interpret this feedback as a, a positive reinforcement or a negative re reinforcement, and, uh, and the model can, uh, can cope with both, uh, both types of reinforcements, but the result will be different, right? So we didn't deal with this in the, in the, in the model, uh, but uh, indeed as, as the infants grow, they use more and more of this kind of uh, information uh, aside, aside from the external guidance that they get from uh, adults. Alfonso? The objects that you used were rigid objects. What happens with soft objects? What happens to the transformations that occur within an object when you grasp it, when you move it, and so on? Right, so actually um, all the objects were kind of soft. I mean, the, for the container, there the were uh, these uh, stuffed animals, which are quite soft. But I, I don't think that uh, uh, the, um, the distortions uh, of the objects uh, at this level uh, are being captured even by uh, this motion analysis algorithm that we were using. Uh, it's very subtle, and um, I think that it almost didn't affect the, the, the shape. But uh, if you try to think about it, the, uh, these distortions uh, um, can actually influence uh, in two directions. First, the, the global shape may, might change a little bit, but the model doesn't care about this. As you saw, 
we, uh, for uh, detecting the object, uh, we actually extract uh, different uh, instances of the object at different poses and stuff like that. So um, the, the, the classifier is quite robust, but it's also very uh, crude uh, detector. And uh, the other thing is that uh, the local appearance may change due to light conditions and stuff like that. Uh, but again, since the, the, the detection is so rough, uh, it doesn't affect the, the, global, uh, uh, the global performance of the model. Uh, we, we are not uh, relying on any fine uh, appearance details. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, lots. <laughs> I won't uh, ignore this side of the room, sorry. Yeah. There can, can you explain to me again this distinction between internal and external signals? Okay, uh, so the, uh, what I call external signal is when you provide an example, like an image, and then you uh, uh, provide also uh, some annotated information or label about this uh, example. For example, uh, if I show you a, a, an image of a horse, and I tell you, I give you a label, uh, this is, uh, there is a horse, so this is one kind of, uh, of uh, external information. The other thing is, for example, for segmentation, if I want to segregate between objects and I give you a, a mask where I show you that all the pixels in this region are labeled uh, as one and all the pixels around it are labeled as zero. This is another example. So in, with inter internal uh, guidance, uh, you only get the, to, to the, the input to the system uh, is only the, the, the video or the image without the label or the annotated mask. And uh, what I mean by internal guidance is that the system, have, uh, the system has some, uh, uh, some rules for the learning that it can generate by itself these kind of, uh, of uh, labels. I understand, but from the point of the infant, does this distinction make any sense? I mean, if it starts kicking at three miles per hour, and it just gets feedback, that's all, right? So the distinction between internal and external that you apply in your lessons for the infant is the same. It's the world giving feedback. OK, so this is related to yeah. what this lady uh, mentioned. And this is true when, uh, when, the, when the infant is able to interact with the, with the environment and uh, record some sensations from this interaction. Uh, again, I'm not uh, talking about this, uh, uh, this kind of learning in, in our models because it, uh, it, is, uh, more, uh, it appears only later in the development, not at the very uh, early age of two, three months of age, right? Uh, but even then, uh, the, the, the system needs uh, somehow to overcome the, uh, the interpretation of these interactions because uh, hitting some object uh, can say that uh, uh, indeed th there was some, um, uh, some force that uh, uh, um, was recorded back from the environment, but the, the infant uh, can uh, uh, interpret this as it, uh, the, the object may move if it hits it, or uh, um, it just hurts or whatever. I mean, the interpretation of the interaction uh, may be uh, complex by itself, and if, uh, if the infant just uses this information, it might not suffice to, to learn much about the, the, the concept of the, of the environment. Um, so if you combine the two, the two mechanisms, uh, this might yield a better, uh, better models. There are some questions over here. Uh, this one, uh, just over here. Uh, so I'm thinking back to the nativism and empiricism debate and also the discussion about congenitally blind individuals yesterday. Uh, so if these are um, innate structures or computations, then how would these computations be adapted by their modalities in the case of, for example, congenitally blind individuals? Um, yeah, so uh, we, we thought about this. And uh, actually, uh, when we looked at uh, 
for example, in containment uh, and uh, fewer ground seg segregation, uh, it turns out that, uh, that uh, blind also have these, uh, these concepts of uh, uh, things that are being in front and behind and things that are being uh, inserted into other things. Uh, so they might use uh, different modalities to construct information. For example, uh, they can sense the rim along a container. Um, and then uh, they can understand the concept of a, a, some kind of paradoxical occlusion by means that uh, some object is maybe in front and behind the same object uh, at the same time. So this concept can emerge uh, using different modalities. They might emerge at different ages, though, because uh, you need uh, the, the motor skills to uh, detect this these features, these discriminating features. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, over here. Thank you very much, very, very interesting. I have a question related to whether you ever um, compare in detail uh, the quality versus the quantity of the training experience. Um, let me explain. Here, I understand very well why you present messy images, because you want to simulate what infants get as an input. Mm -hmm. But from the point of view of seeing whether, if you wanted to boost learning, make it quicker and better, mm -hmm. would, would it be best if we really uh, start off with the mechanism that you are simulating here, giving plenty of messy examples, or a few very purified ones, let's say, with uh, geometrical input and you know, d devoided from all the unnecessary uh, supplementary information that in yeah. the normal environment we get. So uh, we uh, we actually tested the, uh, with some of the with some of the uh, tasks uh, this uh, this direction, and uh, surprisingly or maybe not surprisingly, this didn't help much. So. Uh, for example, uh, for containers, um, we uh, collected a very large data set of, of containers and provided external uh, labels uh, for, um, for containers and non-containers. And then we tried to classify using like, the regular classifiers. Uh, this didn't work very well. So the variability uh, in the appearance is, is too large in order to uh, uh, already uh, capture these, uh, these uh, concepts. And when you use this uh, learning, guy, le learning queue of the uh, discontinuity along the rim, uh, this is a very, very strong signal that is actually better uh, to, to cope with the, the variability in the appearance uh, than just providing more and more very fine labeled uh, examples. Um, and similarly, uh, with, the, the, with the segregation, it also uh, was, the, was the same thing. And uh, when we uh, provided uh, better segmentation uh, uh, images, uh, we came up with the same boundary dictionary, so as, as was with the unsupervised uh, training. Yeah, so. Another question? Another question from Mike. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of a specific question. I was thinking about the team a little bit more in your high view. Mm -hmm. I would imagine you could have something similar with respect to your occlusion relationships in the high view when the object is actually in the container versus above the container, but still in the container. Right. Actually, we don't. We don't know. I, I don't. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with uh, with uh, uh, specific experiments. Uh, but uh, we think that even adults uh, may find this kind of uh, situation uh, somewhat uh, confusing. Um, it really depends on very subtle cues like uh, shadows. Uh, lighting conditions and, and stuff like that, and um, when these uh, uh, with, when these cues are removed, uh, even adults find it difficult 
to, uh, to discriminate between uh, these two uh, uh, static uh, situations. In real life, uh, you, you usually have the dynamics uh, to help you out, and then you can resolve these, uh, these situations uh, uh, using the dynamic information. Very great, and you. Um, we believe that there are not um, signals, and uh, the, these signals may be uh, used for uh, acquiring uh, different models in some combinations of the of these uh, of these signals, and also across different uh, modalities. Uh, for example, the, the mover event is a, a kind of a, a temporal singularity um, in the input, and it can, uh, it can also be used uh, maybe in, uh, in sound, uh, speech, and, and, uh, and things like that in order to, uh, to, ident to discriminate between uh, uh, like a static noise or some harmonic noise and a specific speech or uh, uh, sound that um, has some kind of a semantic uh, um, structure. Um, but we, we don't have a sense of, of uh, how to extract these uh, cues currently, and that's why we are using empirical uh, experience. But uh, we don't think that, although this seems to be a very uh, domain-specific cues, uh, we don't need uh, such a queue for any concept to be acquired. Um, the, the, the tree that I showed before uh, shows how you can combine then later uh, several of the learned concepts along with the, the signals uh, to acquire more and more concepts which are more complex. All right, I think uh, we'll have to uh, end the question period and thank Daniel very much. So now it's uh, coffee and posters, and please be back here at 11.15 sharp, 11.15. <laughs>